I have a habit of when I'm going to speak in a foreign country, I go to Wikipedia and I say, what's the longest word? in the language so I can understand how wide your columns can be without hyphenation. And the first thing I came across was the name of Bangkok, which you see here. That's what I see. I can see it. Do I have to do something to make it? So this is the real name of Bangkok. Bangkok, uh, I discussed with some Thai people. That's just a nickname that they uh, use so that I guess they don't have to spend so much on signage. But today's uh, topic is um, sort of making plain type uh, for a complicated world. It's also sort of a world where we're making type plane for a complicated world, as a lot of us have noticed the number of logo types and custom fonts that have become simplified Latin sans serif typefaces. And the corporate identities that were previously branded by anything else are rebranding with these simple sans serif typefaces at an alarming rate. And I don't think that this is much of an accident. This is what things are starting to look like um, as more and more uh, people realize that the technology is behind the ability for people to express themselves in not just one uh, language. Um, but postscript fonts uh, and then true type with hinting and rising screen, screen resolutions, mobile computing, open type features have made type easier to use, and easier to read, and more functionally advanced for world scripts. This uh, happened from 1986 to 2004. Uh, it was a revolution that started type on the way to doing users' favors. Before uh, uh, 1986 or so, there were, there were only 256 characters in a font. And this was a significant limitation. And there, there wasn't a unified way of encoding characters without Unicode. So these two things sort of grew up together and are the foundation inside of the font format for how we actually work with things. Um, it was the scalability and hinting of fonts in the systems of Adobe and Microsoft that made, uh, or sorry, Apple and Microsoft, that made it immediately possible with a connection to the browser to surf the 1994 World Wide Web. True type fonts made this possible without having lots and lots of bitmaps, which were practically impossible to cover all of the various devices. Uh, this also accelerated the idea that many more world scripts needed sans serif versions to go along with the serif versions. So from 1994 till about 2004, saw a decade of growth in the type industry as well as major consolidation around the development of large typeface families. A sizable number of these were simple sans serif mech families. And it was in this period that Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, and then Google adopted these styles and never changed or added a serif design to their uh, um, to their corporate identities. Then twice in less than a decade, the powers of technology realized fonts were too big. In 2009, they agreed to make web fonts possible to give web developers an alternative to filling servers with rasterized typography. And when the WC3 originally came to the font industry and said we had to do anything, something about this, it was a problem they had caused by launching the web with only the default fonts. And then because the world doesn't just use the default fonts, everybody was rendering fonts in Illustrator or out of uh, Photoshop and filling up servers everywhere in the world. 
And then recently, again in 2015, Apple, Microsoft, along with Google and Adobe, looked at the union of their own performance problems with font families on the web for both web and print. With multiple styles and world script coverage, they decided to make a fairly radical retro upgrade from the Apple TrueType variations to OpenType 1.8 font specification for variable font. So over the last few years then, some type and font tool developers have been working to make variable fonts that do compression and are compressed, uh, but they're doing this to fonts that I now consider to be outdated. And Latinocentric font family structures uh, are more easily uh, encompassed in the specification that just have a wide variety of weights and widths. And the hidden problem with these is that not all of these styles work at all sizes. Obviously, if you use the column on the left, it's very thin. It's not going to work at very small sizes. It will disappear. If you use the column on the right, which is very thick, it will also cause problems at large sizes. So it's been basically up to the user uh, to hack through these styles to look at them and figure out which ones work where. And that works fairly well in print, but it doesn't work very well on the web or at least you have to stay in the middle column to get make sure that your, your fonts are going to be readable and usable everywhere. So this hack grew out of the regular italic, bold and bold italic font families of the office market, developed to deal with OS uh, application indifference to offering optical sizes of fonts transparently to users. Opaquely, many foundries like Font Bureau offered size masters as separate font families. For example, pointer old style text regular had uh, masters for large, medium, and small. And the specialization of optical sizes slowly crept into people's ideas that if you made an a, a, a eight or nine point design, it would be easy, easier to read than a 12 or 14 point design. And that's where Verdana came from. Verdana was a very popular font in the, in the early days of the web because it was an eight-point design, but nobody called it an eight-point design. Uh, Microsoft didn't publicize the fact. Matthew Carter knew that it was an eight-point design because he told me it was. So trying to get people to understand that the reason why Verdana worked is because it was a smaller design master was not done whatsoever. Type-based family architecture changes with variable fonts, with the middle of the family being the default font. And the only contour data in the font is this default. Contour data is changed by the type developer in an organized way to create stylistic axis. Here you see the middle style radiating to a bold and a light and a wide and a condensed. The trick then is quite different from font interpolation. It would normally make this rectangle of fonts, but in in open type uh, variable fonts, what happens is that the variable stylistic exact axes combine to make things and expand the space by adding together what are called the deltas that make the characters change. So for example, the thin compressed in the upper right hand corner is not actually a font. It's not, there's no data for it. The data for the thin and the data for the compressed run into each other and make the thing compressed, if you do it right. So going beyond the issue of compression, which is gained by this, and, uh, a, a variable font is not that much bigger than the regular in many cases, but the compression that you get depends on the glyph repertoire you have. So with Latin, there's almost always compression if you use two or three styles from a variable font. But with kanji or other complex scripts, it's a different story. So um, typography is a good place to start to look at what you can do beyond compression. And in my opinion, the most important aspect of typography after the selection of world script is, and the selection of type classification is what size you're using it, or what size is the typeface is going to be used at. 
So the uh, most important registered axis to me is the optical size axis, where you see here the 72 point changing from the regular and the 8 point also changing from the regular. Um, this optical size axis being added to the specification is incredibly important because it does the use of the kind of automatic favor that kerning does or hinting does. The designer, the user doesn't actually, in most cases, consciously know that uh, 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 the kerning is turned on. And when they're using the fonts in low resolution environments in the past, and in some Windows uh, environments today, they don't know that they're using hints. They're being done a favor by the font developer and the technology that comes along with it that improves the font. And I think that optical sizes can be used the same way, where the user just sets the size and the optical size is automatically selected. A favor is being done to the user. And this is part of the trust that used to exist between font foundries and the users, that when you went into a type shop, as I did when I was a student, I open the drawer, and there's 12-point type in it. And if I use that 12-point type, then I can trust that the person who made it was looking at it at 12-point, because that's what the size of the type is. And that makes a big difference to me. Um, it also means that it's up to me in the process after setting the type to make whatever changes to the process make the type readable. So I, have, I can adjust the paper that I'm going to use. I can adjust the ink that I'm going to use. I can adjust. The, uh, the speed of the press or how hard, how hard I, I, I push to make it, it the impression happen. Um, these, this is fundamentally different from the web where uh, the, 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 uh, the, the environment you're publishing to, you can't change that. It's, you have high resolution and low resolution and multiple portals and multiple rendering engines and all this stuff. And you can't just say, uh, I'm not going to deal with that part of it as a type developer, you have to say, I'm making this thing that works with everything. And the user has the same issue. It's an inversion of the print world, where uh, instead of the fonts changing the same, the, the fonts staying the same, and the, uh, um, the, 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 the production process changing. Here, we have a production process you cannot change, uh, unless you want to limit yourself to who your audience is. But if that is the case, then something else has to change in order for the appearance of a website to be consistent across all this. And the answer to that change is the font. So what any one very action variation axis controls and how it is named is ultimately up to the type developer. But in general, variable axis control the parts of glyphs in a coordinated way to make the scripts in a single font uh, useful for the user. The parts of glyphs come in six flavors for all scripts. Uh, and I go over this in detail in a Type Paris presentation that you can see online. I won't do it uh, here, but on the, on the, uh, the far side, you see uh, eight letters, and you see the ends and the beginnings of the strokes of those letters. And this is a common thing uh, for all uh, scripts. They, they have strokes, and those strokes have beginnings, and they have ends. It's a very simple, very, very straightforward system that I think in terms of. Um, the difference is that each script uh, has a different way of blending these various parts to make their things happen. So, uh, for example, you see on the right some, uh, some uh, kanji characters. And the, the, the way that the beginnings and the ends of, of, of the strokes are uh, in the fonts are very, very different. Uh, there are some glyphs have, have dozens of beginnings and ends, and a, a few have uh, very few characters, as, as opposed to Latin font on the, on, the, on the other side, where you see that there's a certain number. Uh, the O has none. Uh, it is a circle, so it doesn't have a beginning and an end in this particular design. And uh, um, the uh, other characters have a few of them. And there's big differences in some of the other uh, 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 classes of things, like, for example,
example, in uh, Latin, we have very few apertures. The lowercase e comes up, and I call that a, 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 a little bit of nothing in between two other nothings. So there's a nothingness outside of the character, and there's a nothingness inside of the character, and then there's a little point there where the, those things meet. Um, and in Latin, there are maybe six or seven of these in the entire alphabet. In Chinese, there are thousands and thousands of apertures. I guess it's nice if the screen goes to sleep so you can rest for a while. <laughs> I don't know how to make this thing go to sleep never, but that's how I am. I don't sleep. Anyways, after a lot of type design experience and watching the variety of typographic solutions from my custom work with Roger and other designers and with Apple TrueType variable fonts, I came to realize that uh, typeface families and the relationship between them and other scripts, regardless of what scripts are being mixed in a font, contain primary parameters in the heights, the weights, the widths of the elements of the glyphs that are blended like an artist's palette to form a weight, width, and optical size of, 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 of uh, typeface families. And so here you see some of those things in action, um, separating these typographic colors as, you, as I think of them, as you see a few characters animated here, creating individual axes for each parametric uh, value I'm demonstrating. Uh, on the top, you see the, uh, the width changing without the weight changing at all. And uh, on the right, you see the X height changing without the weight changing at all. And then there are other ones that have to do with the alignments uh, of uh, other parts of Latin letters that uh, make it so that I can, I can think in terms of what it is that is going to be formed into the typography in a design space and not just on a letter-by-letter -letter basis. And with this, I can make conditions occur so that if the, uh, the column width is narrow, then I can automatically program a web page to have shorter descenders. And if it's a longer, wider column, I can automatically program it to have uh, longer descenders. And the way that HTML and CSS work, I can interpolate the things in between. So if there is going to be a range of column widths, I can have a range of automatically generated or automatically used um, uh, 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 descenders. And here you see the separate par parametric axis, uh, the vertical and hor horizontal stem weights of the A transforms, while on the left, the width of the internal, the white space is staying the same. And on the right, the heights of the internal white states are absorbing the increase in horizontal uh, weight because those white spaces are the children of the X height. So uh, you, you, if you're going to keep the X height the same and you're going to change the vertical weights of glyphs, you, you, you have to encroach on the white space. And this is just the way it's organized where the type designer is trying to make things work the same way that the user is experiencing and making decisions in the uses of the fonts. And so we made a, uh, uh, gathered together these things in a single font. Uh, as the axis I show here from Amstelvara, which is a, uh, a font that Google uh, commissioned us to do to demonstrate things about uh, about um, uh, about variable fonts. And uh, originally, they wanted me to make one font with like 17 axes in it. And I explained to them that uh, I wanted to live through the project, so uh, I, we could split it into multiple fonts, and I could just have w one font called Decovara that was demonstrating some things and another font called Amstelvar that was demonstrating others. And to mix them up uh, in Amstelvar alone was very confusing to people. Uh, but I'll get to that in a second, I think. Um, and these are powerful capabilities. One power comes from the use of the value system that is in, expressed in parts of the M. Um, our decision was to normalize from whatever the units for M are. So if you have a 4,000 unit system, uh, you can convert that to thousands. If you have a 256 unit M square, you can convert that to thousands. And the point of that is to get a value system that is part of the typography, unlike OS2 tables, which have nothing to do with typography, really. They're a technical solution to something. Our parametric values 
dovetail right into the M square. And the M square is the unit of, of both the web and of, uh, of print. Um, the M square is, is the basis where everything goes from. So if you don't have values that are uh, associated with the M square, how are you going to get that M square and this font to work together without parametric axis? And I haven't heard any other answers. Um, a second power comes uh, if these values uh, are consistently measured across alphabets. So if I have parametric values and in one font I'm measuring the O stem and another font I'm measuring the H stem, then I'm going to have a different range, but I'm still getting a parametric view uh, of what, how much of the font is, is, how much weight is changing. I can have, I have, a, I have a range that I can work with that relates to fonts. If I, if I have fonts that are measuring exactly the same thing, then I can actually do font substitution by parametric axis from one to another. So, wake up. So here you see those, uh, the parametric axes moving uh, from the previous slide I showed where we're going from 12 point to 8 point. And these, this is an animation that is taking you through the changes one axis at a time. So first the uh, weight changes, then the width changes, then the X height changes, and then the center changes. Um, and just by dialing up those, I can, I, I can get from my regular to my optical size by just identifying the the locations in the parametric axis for where that optical size is. Um, so, uh, going in the opposite direction, you can see that I am changing the, the weight, and I'm changing the width, and then I'm changing the X height, and then I am changing the contrast. Uh, in this case, the, the ascenders don't change. Uh, and I can make it so that that is going on uh, in the uh, in the variable font, so that not all the axes are going all the time. And so what this means is that the parametrics uh, have a, a possibility with a combinatorial explosion of functionality gained by broad use of these thousand units uh, with uh, over non-typographic uh, uh, values, and I can combine these parametric values with other standards like seconds of time and degrees of rotation and yaw and colors. All those things are standardized, but we don't have a language and standard for the parametric values of type. So trying to get that uh, uh, through uh, the technical powers has been a little bit difficult, but I think that uh, uh, as times go by, time goes by, uh, people see the advantages of this. Uh, it's not just for type designers to use. This is something that uh, users can use uh, as well. Um, here's one registered uh, access that isn't registered that's called grade. Uh, I'm convinced that something must happen uh, with the standard and or implementation eventually because everybody likes grades. Uh, you show the, the concept of grades to people And they uh, see immediately a value of changing the weight of the typeface without any of the widths changing. Uh, and this has uh, a number of applications just for, if you can imagine, uh, taking a variable font uh, like this one and any non-Latin typeface that you have to use, you could mix to the Latin typeface to that Thai or to that Chinese. So. Uh, not to mention any names, but registering access and useful value systems and font technology implementations is not really a good business for type design companies to be in. This is for these other companies to be in because it's really their issue. Uh, so going forward with that, it's going to be an important, uh, an important part of, of uh, the user experience is that you, know, you have to tell these people that you want something better than what they've got. So typography is opening to an amazing range of possibilities, all now programmable in web code, and uh, for the, uh, the variable technology is in all the major browsers now. 
uh, but interoperability represented by uh, registered axes, uh, properly useful values, and font technology implementation, implementation is up to these small number of companies, not a large group of companies. And they're looking for your input. It's hard to get through to them sometimes, but uh, uh, there's all sorts of places on the web where you can talk to them. Um, Aiming the issues of variable fonts and parametric axes and interoperability at the opportunities of InterScript compatibility starts with a couple of ideas. One of them is the M square or the mosaic of composition that comes from the use of these rectangular windows around with is natural to and adapted to one, uh, one, some world scripts and some systems among each scripts uh, easier than others. So uh, this sort of relies on the understanding that we don't all form words, words the same way. I mean, when, uh, when I'm finished designing a Latin typeface, if I want to do a dictionary, I've got years of work to do. I've got to compose all the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of words of all the languages that use Latin and uh, you know, design the typeface in a week, do the dictionary in five years. Uh, with Japan, uh, you design the typeface and you're pretty close to a dictionary. Um, it's, a, it's a totally different uh, way of assembling the ideas that uh, we have in our heads that we put on the page. And so because of that, we have different, we have different ways of looking at composition, not just the direction that we're moving, but also the, uh, the way that the words form. Uh, and also, um, the way that we use the M square is very different between Arabic and Chinese, and those are probably the, the most extreme uh, differences. The, the, the in interesting thing about that is that there's, uh, there's an expectation on the part of the user that if they go to a multilingual font, and they go to a single instance of that font, that all of the glyphs of all the scripts of the font work at that size and style, which is bold. And I've always believed this to be fairly impossible um, uh, because kanji is more complicated than Latin. It can't scale as far as Latin. Uh, and um, in, in Latin, for example, you have a lowercase e that needs a minimum of five pixels to be readable. Uh, there, there are Chinese characters that require a minimum of 30 or 40 pixels to be readable. And um, there are different formulas that are used. So if you looked at uh, Kitaro's presentation this morning, there were, uh, he showed uh, lots of uh, kanji that had to do with the tree. And the uh, tree glyph on the left side was making all kinds of changes as it went to be combined with all these other characters. Well. Those changes are all possible at high resolution, but as you go down the resolution spectrum, you get to fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer requirements of how many glyphs you actually can use in that tree. Uh, and down at 16 pixels, there's only one possible solution. So resolution has a way of making it so that the complexity of uh, kanji can be reduced as it's being served to the user. The user doesn't need 16 versions of that tree. Uh, that tree radical, they can probably do with one or two versions of that tree radical. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, something that also happens when you add weight or you reduce the size of the font, that there are fewer possibilities that work and the adjustments that you make become finer. And so there's, uh, this is something that I started working on when I was looking at Chinese and Japanese in the early 80s, and then I came over and visited people in Hong Kong, and they not only agreed, but they were developing a system that worked this way, so that they were making a system that they called 2 by 2 which is two type designers working for two months, could do the 3,400 characters that were standardized by then. Uh, it was rapidly moving towards 7,500 characters or so, but um, the, 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 the idea is that you have these strokes radicals and recipes, and that you can make a high resolution, high quality uh, kanji font using this. Uh, but uh, my idea at the time, and I still believe in, is that this has to move into the operating system. Because this is the way that you get maximum compression on one hand and maximum quality on the other hand, is by 
understanding how these strokes and radicals and recipes work uh, uh, so that you can sort of use variation, variation space to make all that happen. Um, uh, oops. Here's a, a small demonstration from inside of uh, oops, from inside of Amsolar. Uh, Google asks us to demonstrate just a couple of Chinese uh, uh, parametric values, and these are values that can change the height and width of kanji. I noticed that there was a, an open source uh, Chinese font that was uh, that was published twice. It was published with one set of metrics where the where the where the Chinese characters work with Latin and another version where it worked by itself better. And this is just in, this is just a huge amount of data to be sending around just for this one parametric change. Uh, so the idea is that if you can build these interscript relationships into a variable font and uh, you can look at the top of any web page to see what uh, languages are being used. It calls the Unicode used in this the very first line. You can tell from the code uh, which fonts are being used. And you can look at the, uh, Google can look at the text and figure out which one is the predominant language. And then you can make changes to the fonts so that the predominant reading that's going on has the parametric axes set for that person. So uh, what you saw in the previous slide uh, it's an overall width and height being adjusted, and the eight strokes of Chinese getting taller and shorter and longer and narrow in response to the overall metrics. This is changing the type at the level of style, uh, changing styles of Chinese and Latin for better use when composed. In order to get the best uh, variation functionality from complex scripts, uh, the proprietary use of this stuff, as I said, needs to move into the operating system or we're still going to have problems out here. Here's an example. I'd also like to use this in Latin, for example. Um, uh, you see the top, I have combined the umlaut with four characters. And they're all being dictated by the I. Because somebody came out of an audience in Typo Berlin about 10 years ago, uh, from the Ukrainian market and said to Matthew Carter that uh, Verdana is a complete failure because the, uh, uh, the, the, the umlauts are too far apart and only Ukrainian uses this character twice. So you ended up with uh, the dots were overlapping each other so you had two I's and three dots instead of four. Well, so then that made all the type designers in the West squish their, their, their their dots together, and that's not the best solution for all the glyphs. Um, and so if you want to make the best solution, you have to include all these various uh, umlauts uh, in your font uh, to get them uh, right over every single character. This adds a lot of complexity and uh, also a lot of data to your font. It can add, you know, accents aren't very big, but if you're adding hundreds of accents or if you're had, adding hundreds of radicals, uh, as opposed to just defining uh, an axis, a width axis for for your accents, and the umlauts getting further and closer apart, and I can uh, I can associate uh, the umlauts uh, that I need with particular glyphs and get the best results for each glyph. Um, and this goes very very far into the uh, the standard glyph set. Uh, I should be able to make the percent sign from a variation space that has the O, the figure O being manipulated to be used for fractions and other things. I should be able to grab a glyph from some other place in the variation space and put it into the percent sign to join the fraction bar that's already there. And that saves a lot, a lot of space. And it's not just the space of the glyphs, it's the space, space of the variation data and everything else that goes along with making a separate percent sign that has all this stuff on it, it just is gone now, and all the percent is now being defined inside of the variation space. Uh, and so I don't have to have variation data on the percent because I've already got it on the O, and it's getting taller and shorter and bolder and narrower and higher and lower contrast, and that's all happening. And I just look for the, I, I can you know, decide, 
decide where I want to go in the variation space for the O for the percent sign, and there's no addition of theta. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about this is I, I got really mad about this in 2009. I read an article in the New York Times that said that, uh, that uh, the Chinese government and technology powers of the world have not gotten their act together, and 60 million Chinese people lost their names. Uh, to 1 percent of the population of the world having to change their names may not seem much like a problem to the other 99 percent, but to me, I, got, I was totally enraged by this. And the problem is just extending the standards and the technology so that, uh, so that you, know, you may not have all the glyphs in there, but you have the ability to assemble them if you want to. And this existed in the olden days with word processing stuff. You could, if, if your boss didn't have his name in the standard, you could type in the, the radical and, and, and strokes and, and get the glyph in some way or another. Uh, and we, we can't really lose that. Uh, so. Um, I hope that uh, all of you can experiment with variation type and see how it works with your script and see how things can improve uh, the, the readability and the design abilities uh, just of your own script and also with other world scripts. And thank you very much.